This is a review of the Q670 white PCB motherboard from CWWK. It can be difficult to find a fully featured ITX NAS motherboard at an affordable price. Most consumer boards have a limited number of SATA, USB, network, and M.2 ports. Server boards do exist, but usually run on the order of $500 or more, and they can frequently use older technology. This CWWK Q670 motherboard rings in at about $230 US if you buy it directly from CWWK's website like I did, and you get all the features you need for a small 8-bay NAS. The Q670 houses an LGA1700 socket which supports Intel 12th, 13th, and 14th gen CPUs. It offers three M.2 PCIe 4.0x4 slots, one on the top that can accommodate an 80mm or a 110mm M.2 SSD, and then the other two are on the bottom of the motherboard. There is a full-size 16x PCIe 5.0 slot and dual DDR5 RAM slots. The ports on the back include two USB 2.0 Type-A ports, three USB Type-A 10 gigabit ports, a 20 gigabit USB Type-C port, and a full-size display port and HDMI port, and also an audio jack. There's also two 2.5 gigabit Intel Ethernet ports, whereas one is an I226V and the other is an I226LM. And then of course you also have traditional common features like four pin fan headers. You have two of them on here, one for the case, one for the CPU. There's a type A USB 2.0 connector right on board. And then you also have the connectivity to the front of the case with the USB 3 uh, 20 pin adapter there, as well as a type E, which could go to a type C to the front of the case. Then you actually have the pins for an audio jack. And of course you've got uh, the 24 pin ATX power connector there, and then the eight pin power connector for the CPU, and then your front header for power, lights, and hard drive status, etc. there. Now most importantly, it contains two SFF8643 connectors, each of which can support four SATA connections over the Intel SATA controller on the Q670 chipset. Now that means a total of eight SATA devices can be connected directly to the mainboard using breakout cables like this one. For my build, I'm using an Intel Core i5-12400, 32GB of Crucial Pro DDR5 RAM, and a Silverstone 500W SFX power supply, and this is all being built into a Johnsbo N2 case. Now since the Johnsbo N2 only accommodates five internal drives, I will connect four internally, and then four externally for testing purposes. The internal drives to, will be connected to one SATA connection, the external ones to the other. Once I got the components built up on the motherboard and I powered it on, it took a while to first boot up. And I think it's important to note that the first time you boot it up, or even if you update your BIOS or change your RAM, it may take a minute to several minutes to actually show any signs of life, but just give it some time and it will boot up. And that's because it has to go through some form of initial validation. And uh, once it does start to boot up, you can press the delete key to get in the BIOS, and then the F7 key will bring up the boot menu. Now I do plan on doing some testing in Windows 11, Ubuntu, as well as TrueNAS Scale, and I did install those no problem onto M.2 SSDs without any issue. For Windows though, you will need the Ethernet drivers and the chipset drivers from Intel's website to get a clean device manager. I'll leave a link to those in the description. Once I got the operating systems installed and did some preliminary testing, I checked for idle power consumption. Now with the stock BIOS and settings, running just a CPU, RAM, one M.2 SSD, an ethernet connection, a mouse dongle, and an HDMI cable, it drew about 25 watts of power at idle. If you take a quick look at HWinfo64, you can see there are only C states C0 and C1, so it's not able to go into the higher C states to save more power. However, there is an option in the BIOS to enable C states. And once that's enabled, you can see the CPU settling in the higher C states at idle, and this ended up resulting in a power draw of only about 20 watts. I was curious if I could actually reduce that consumption even more, so I used my Google Foo and came across a post on the Home Lab subreddit. A user by the name of Yanji1 modded the stock BIOS to enable power saving features, like enabling ASPM on the PCI Express lanes. Now, just as a disclaimer, if you try this, update your BIOS at your own risk, as there's always a risk of breaking your system. And even if the BIOS is fine, if you lose power during the flash, you will be SOL. So use a battery backup. So to install the BIOS, it's pretty easy. You just download it and copy the files over to a FAT32 formatted USB flash drive, and then you can boot off of that. Once the BIOS is installed, you'll see under the chipset tab that there are a lot more options unlocked. But what we are interested in is the PCI Express configuration. You can enable ASPM for each individual PCI Express root port by setting it to auto, 
which should result in reduced power consumption. There's something like 28 total PCIe lanes, and so you're going to have to go through each one individually and adjust them to auto in order to get the full effect of the power savings. Now you should keep in mind that you should also disable the PCH PCIe power gating option, otherwise your network cards and M.2 slots underneath the motherboard might not work, as I found out the hard way. Now as a matter of fact, there's actually an updated BIOS on CWWK's website, including ASPM, so assuming it is attempting to do the same thing, the only problem is that the network ports didn't work after updating the BIOS, and there are no additional settings like the PCIe PCIe power gating to set in their BIOS, so I'd advise using the modded BIOS by Yanji One over the current updated BIOS on the CWWK website. In any case, on the modified BIOS, with the C-States enabled and ASPM enabled on all the PCIe ports, this resulted in about only about an 18 watt power draw while idle, so it's about a 2 watt power savings. So here's the idle power draw using the Silverstone SX500W, and we have the stock BIOS and the top two, and then modified BIOS down below. And you can see the stock BIOS at default drew about 25 watts, same thing with the modified BIOS. Enable C states in both cases, we ended up with about 20 watts. And then with the ability to enable ASPM on the PCIe slots, dropped a couple more watts down to 18. Then if we go headless, basically without the mouse keyboard adapter as well as the uh, display cable, that drops into about another watt. And of course you can obviously do that with the stock one here. So you're looking at between 17 to 19 watts as a base idle state with a single SSD, CPU, RAM, and Ethernet cable attached. Regarding stability, I did run the Linux stress test for about 12 hours straight with both the stock BIOS as well as the modified BIOS with all the power saving features enabled and there were no issues. Additionally, I did install a 128GB set of Crucial Pro RAM, as in two 64GB sticks, and they were detected perfectly fine and usable in Windows, Ubuntu, and TrueNAS. I ran Memtest 86 Plus for over 12 hours straight with no stability issues or errors. Now while Memtest 86 Plus is meant more for testing the RAM, it can also find instability in other areas in the system. Now for testing the components on the motherboard. First, the most boring part, USB. Using a Sabrent 20 gigabit USB to M.2 adapter, which housed a Corsair MP700 Elite 2 terabyte M.2 PCIe SSD. I validated all the USB ports and they perform exactly as expected. And just to clarify that the USB-C 20 gigabit port in the back is simply a USB 20 gigabit port. It is not a Thunderbolt or USB 4. So it doesn't offer display port or capability to power the motherboard with it. Also like to note that uh, all the other USB ports, USB 3 ports are 10 gigabit, whereas the one for the front header is only five. For the two and a half gigabit ethernet connections, I didn't do a whole lot of testing other than validate that they were connected. And I ran an iPerf3 and did a 10 by one gigabyte file copy test over the network. There were no real issues found and operated normally. To test the M.2 ports, I also used the Corsair MP700 Elite 2 terabyte BCIe 5.0 NVMe M.2 SSD. Now it supposedly has a read sequential performance of 10,000 megabyte per second when it's placed in a PCIe 5.0 slot. So it should easily be able to saturate a PCIe 4.0 X4 slot with a theoretical throughput of 8,000 megabytes per second. Although realistically a PCIe 4.0 X4 usually doesn't exceed 7,000 megabyte per second due to overhead. And I actually did reach about 7,000 megabyte per second performance with Crystal Disk Mark in Windows and about 6,500 megabyte per second performance with a FIO test in Ubuntu. I did install the Corsair MP700 in each of the three M.2 slots, and here you can see the 100 gigabyte file performance test results. And you can see M.2 number one is green, and that's one on top of the motherboard. Number two and number three are the ones underneath the motherboard. And looking at the read test here, I wrote both to the ext 4 file system level as well as to the device level, and also in TrueNAS to ZFS, and again in device and TrueNAS just as a comparison. And you can see here the overall performance for the most part was about 6400, 6500 megabyte per second read, and about the same for the writes, except for when you got to the TrueNAS ZFS, we're about 2800 megabyte per second write performance, but that's probably because writing to ZFS, there's some overhead likely due to the uh, validating or creating checksums for the files. I also connected two WD SN770 Black SSDs in RAID 0, and I ran a file sequential read performance, which went from a single SSD performance of 4,800 megabytes per second to 9,400 megabytes per second. So that's close to double that of a single disk. So there doesn't seem to be any bottleneck there. Although performing an actual file copy of 101 gigabyte files between the three slots uh, using the SN770 SSDs 
resulted in only about 1500 megabytes per second in Ubuntu with EXT4 and Windows NTFS. However, TrueNAS ZFS actually managed about 1900 megabytes per second. To validate performance through the PCIe slot, I did attempt to use a PCIe to M.2 adapter, again using the Corsair MP700 Elite 2 terabyte SSD, but it gave inconsistent results. Like anywhere from 20 megabytes per second, essentially USB 2.0 speeds, to 1500 megabytes per second, which is faster, but nowhere near the maximum speed of a 10,000 megabyte per second the SSD could achieve. I did test it on that PCIe adapter in my desktop PC, but that's only limited to a PCIe 4.0 slot, and in that case it did max out at about 6500 megabyte per second, which is more or less expected realistically for a PCIe 4.0 x4 connection, but for some reason I can't seem to get it operate properly on this motherboard. So I went to validate the PCIe slot through other means. I used an LSI SAS HBA adapter, as well as an Intel 10 gigabit network adapter, and both were detected and performed without any issues. I also installed an AMD Radeon RX 6400 video card, as well as an RTX 3050 video card. Now neither of these cards require external power, so it draws all of its power directly from the PCIe slot, which should be able to provide up to 75 watts. So after running a few GPU benchmarks, they performed as expected, and the 3050 drew over 70 watts of power without issue. So I think the PCIe slot itself is fine, it's just that that PCIe to M.2 adapter had some compatibility issues for some reason. Now on to the SATA connections. I connected eight Samsung 850 Pro 250GB SATA SSDs to the onboard SATA connectors. Four were connected to the backplane on the Johnsville N2, and then the other four were connected externally. One thing that I would like to note though is that the cable that clips onto the SATA connector has a latch. Now there's a bridge material that the latch connects to on the connector on the motherboard. On one of those connectors on the motherboard, that material broke off. So while you can still connect the cable, it is loose and can easily be pulled out. So that's something to be aware of. And uh, I'm gonna look to see if I can find a way to uh, cl clip that on better, even with that uh, bridge material gone. Now just to get a baseline for the performance of the SSDs, you can see all eight SSDs there. I'm gonna do a couple of basic benchmarks. Do a pseudo HD Parm. Dash T dev, and we'll just pick uh, I know SDF. And there you can see the HD Prime test. The read test of SDF is about 539 megabytes per second. And there I just did a, another quick test of another random disk, and we have about the same performance. Now for a FIO 20 gigabyte write test. So you can see it's running at about 320, 325 megabytes per second. And the average speed with FIO is 339 megabytes per second. Now I'm going to create two four disk RAID zeros, one on each connector. So there you can see that we peaked at 1929 megabytes per second on each of the four disk RAID 0 arrays. And realistically, they had about 530 megabytes per second read performance times four. So it should be around 2000 megabytes per second, which that is a little bit shy of that. So now there you can see that we have the MD0 RAID 0 array with eight disks, those eight Samsung SSDs. So there's the result of the eight disk RAID 0, which is 1940 megabytes per second, right around what the four disk RAID 0 was. So there may be some limitation to the performance of the SATA controller, and it may very well be limited to a single PCIe 4.0 X1 lane. Now, I don't think that that's a huge deal, because if you're dealing with hard drives, the absolute fastest you're probably going to get is 250 megabytes per second times 8 disks in a RAID 0. You know, you're talking 2,000 megabytes per second anyways, and that's, you know, who's going to run 8 disks in a RAID 0 array? Usually it's going to be a, a RAID 10, a RAID 1. RAID 5, RAID 6 maybe, and you're going to lose substantial performance in that direction. Plus, you're never going to reach that peak 250 megabytes per second unless it's a brand new empty disk. But I did run a few benchmarks using the PCIe LSI SAS HBA add-in card to compare it to, and the 8-disk RAID 0 peaked at about 2800 megabytes per second. So there's even a bottleneck there somewhere because 8 SSDs at 530 megabytes per second each should be closer to 4000 megabytes per second total throughput in a RAID 0. But when I did an actual file transfer test of 101 gigabyte files, the performance was about the same between the onboard SATA ports and the PCIe add-in card, and it maxed out at about 1500 megabytes per second anyways. So once I finished doing some testing on the SSDs, I did connect eight hard drives that I had on hand, four C8 Exos X18 18 terabyte, and four WD white label 14 terabyte drives. The Seagate drives were on one connector, WD were on the other, and the Seagate drives have a single disk sequential read performance about 240 megabytes per second. The WD is about 200 megabytes per second. So combined in a RAID 0, they will only be as fast as the slowest disk. 
So 200 times 8 is approximately 1600 megabytes per second. So when I did a 100 gigabyte file copy test, it resulted in about 1300 megabytes per second, whether using the onboard SATA ports or the add-in card. So if you're looking for an ITX form factor motherboard that can support eight SATA drives, three M.2 SSDs at full PCIe 4.0 X4 speeds, offer a multitude of USB ports and dual two and a half gigabit ethernet ports, this is a rare find. One feature that would be nice to have is a 10 gigabit network port, but I don't think that's a deal breaker and two and a half gigabit is fine in most use cases. You'll also have the PCIe slot for expansion and the multitude of M.2 slots can offer expansion options as well although you are a bit limited with clearance with SSDs underneath the motherboard. Overall, I think this motherboard is an amazing value at $239. It is surprisingly stable, at least this one that I bought directly from CWWK store, and I don't see any real compromises. Obviously, the broken SAS SATA connector is a little problematic, but a little bit of ingenuity can solve that. Of course, longevity and support are in question, but if it just works as is, and it is stable after extended stress testing, and solid state components, as long as they're cooled properly, tend to last quite a while. So I hope you found this video helpful, and until next time, talk to you later.